Welcome to Untold Stories of Innovation, where we amplify untold stories of insight, impact, and innovation. Powered by Untold Content, I'm your host, Katie Trout Taylor. Our guest today is Maria McLean. She is the Innovation Project Manager at the United States Playing Card Company. One of their latest games is It's Blunderful. It's so much fun and a little embarrassing. <laughs> it's so great to have you on the on the podcast, Maria. Thank you for being here. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'd love to start our conversation by asking you where your personal story of innovation began. Sure. So I think it actually began before I even realized it began. (laughs) Um, I'd say it was when I was a pretty young girl. My dad was an entrepreneur. Really? Yes. He actually started his own airline. He was the first founder and president of Comair. What? (laughs) Oh, my goodness. Whoa. (laughs) Did you understand the immensity of that when you were a little girl? No, because I was probably two years old at the time. So, I, you know, I would toddle through the airport at the time, but I didn't, <laughs> you know, understand the gravity of the situation. Um, but he was always been a, a huge idea guy. And, you know, from the time I could talk, he was always, you know, brainstorming ideas with me and and what can we make of this? And Did he ask um, a lot of what if questions when or, or why? Did, was he like the one dad who didn't get annoyed when you said, why, why, why? Did he yeah, just exactly. love that? He loved he that. Ate it up. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah. And he always told me like, He always used to give me this example when I was young, and he would say, let's look at something like fire. Like, fire can be very destructive, and people can look at it as something that could potentially hurt you. But it can also be viewed as, you know, a sign of warmth, and it's used for cooking. So he always told me to kind of, like, look at the flip side of the coin. Wow. And for every you know, um, obstacle or challenge or negative thing that I would encounter, he'd be like, well, what what good can come of that? Wow. And so we would so talk about a, stuff like a that. a level of optimism there and yes. curiosity, too. Yes. One of the smartest ways to be curious is to look at something from a different angle or perspective. Mm-hmm. That's amazing. Yeah. So, so that I would started say at a young that age. Would ki- that was kind of what started it for me. And then um, I have always been a huge fan of Disney. Ever since I was two years old, my parents would take me to Disney World, and I would just be, like, awestruck (laughs) at the surroundings. And I think that that is one thing that has totally stuck with me throughout my career is just, you know— making people happy, making people smile. Um, I was, I've was, i always been, you know, a big fan of Walt Disney and his story. So um, I think that really resonated with me and inspired me. So is that your heart must have led you then to the U.S. Playing Card Company? I think and, so. And the level of fun there <laughs> yes. and joy that that brings, that, yeah, that play absolutely. brings to our lives. Absolutely, yeah. So tell me about innovation um, at, at U.S. Playing Card. Um, Tell me about the kinds of projects you work on, the kinds of uh, products and services that you sell. Sure. So um, we are, you know, over 150 years old. um, And, uh, you know, most people know us for our bicycle red and blue playing cards. We also do casino playing cards. Aviator to Yes, Aviator B. Yeah, absolutely. Um, And so I was kind of brought on. They had done uh, quite a bit of research on the traditional card playing consumer. And what they found out was that 75 to 80 percent of people that bought a deck of playing cards, you know, in a given year have also bought um, a border card game outside of that. And so we really felt like we had a, um, you know, a space to kind of enter this board game industry. I'm not sure if you're familiar, if you play board games, oh, but yeah. there has been a huge renaissance yes, of, yeah. of tabletop games Absolutely. in the past, you know, probably five to 10 years. Yes. Everything from Munchkin to Settlers of Catan and... I- Catan. Are you a Catan or a Catan? Um, you know, I, I say both, <laughs> depending on the day. Uh, podcast listeners, sure. you can give us comments <laughs> right. on this one and critique our pronunciation. <laughs> exactly. But yes, it's so true. Um, yeah, so there's been this huge board game renaissance. So I was kind of brought in to um, explore that space a little bit and do some research and, um, you know, really work with inventors on um, acquiring, you know, the licensing rights for some of these really interesting games that are out there. How exciting. You yes. know, it's it, it's coming. It's interesting that this revolution in board game play is happening at the same time that technology has become such a ubiquitous part of our lives. And it just it I think it reveals that no matter how much we lean on technology and and are addicted to technology that we still crave 
in-person play with other people and and that we want that tactical experience together in the board game and playing cards. They, they It creates that environment, that experience. Yeah, speaking to people that... Um that really resonated with them because, you know, we were asking their motivation for why they play board games or, you know, why they get together with friends and are still playing these card games when there's tons of, you know, video games and VR and interactive and all this, all this thing. Um, And they say, you know, the number one thing was to de-stress. There's so much clutter, (laughs) you know, that you experience on the internet. Even when people are watching Netflix, you Mm -hmm. know, they're still constantly scrolling their phone and multiple multitasking. And so they use games as a way to, number one, de-stress, but also to get to learn about their friends, which I thought was very Mm -hmm. interesting. So, um, you know, people get on social media and they'll see a highlight of their friends' lives and you see their vacations they go on and you think you know everything about them. Um, But they really were craving, um, you know, deeper connections and and motivations for why people act the way they do. And and games really allow you to kind of dig into that a little bit. Yeah, you know, with such a classic kind of experience, like playing cards and your company being 150 years old, you know, I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you innovate, knowing that certain things are just so core to a culture, like playing cards or or gathering around the table together. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, How do you innovate without changing those traditions, but but still... Um, try to to move your industry forward, move that experience forward. Sure. I mean, I think the one you know key thing that we want to retain is just that joy of play. We consider ourselves memory makers for our consumers. Um, there probably isn't one person that you would meet that didn't say, "Oh, I you know remember sitting down playing." euchre or go fish or rummy with my grandparents and you know we'd all get together on the holidays and or or on the weekends or whatever it might Mm -hmm. be and kind of and talk and it it was just really a means for conversation um so we definitely wanted to keep you know that aspect of the of the games um but we really wanted to explore various um unique themes and um unique immersive experiences. It's really the, um, not so much necessarily the story of, sometimes it is, can be the story of the inventors, but when you're playing a game, you can be an animal or you can be a pirate and it gives you the freedom to be politically incorrect, (laughs) Um, which a lot of people are looking for nowadays. Um, So it really kind of takes you out of your environment. So we were looking for ways to be innovative in creating an experience that um, outside of your your day to day and how you act during your day to day. So tell me where that's led you. What what are some of your recent products or projects that you've uh, worked on as a result of those findings? Sure. So we have um, three games out this year. Um, two are uh, what we would classify as party games. And one is a little bit of a light strategy game. Um, so I do a lot of inventor relations. Um, and I work with the inventors that are submitting these prototypes. It's really interesting because we'll get these prototypes in on, you know, index cards or, you know, people just do clip art off the internet. Um, And so you really have to have a good imagination to see, you know, where the game can go. Um, But in talking to these inventors, it's really important to me to get their stories. Um, Like, for example, one of the games that we have out is called Tattoo Stories. And it was created by a sixth grade middle school teacher. And his sole motivation for the game, people are very hesitant to do drawing games because, um, you know, well, I'm not a good artist or, you know, I don't want to show my work. Um, But his, his whole purpose was to get his students to just reveal their creativity and kind of share it with the world and feel okay in doing that. Um, so a lot of that is brought across with the game, whether it be from like a humorous scenario or, um, you know, a relatable story or something like that. Um, so that's that's one example. Um, and then another inventor we worked with um, on a game called Shuffle Grand Prix, he was actually a video game creator. Okay. And he would use um, kind of cards to simulate what was going on in the video game. But he said it was easier to do it on cards so that they could, you know, run statistics and different things. Um, and he ended up just creating a card game out of it. But huh. a lot of the inspiration was drawn from, like, the video game Mario Kart. 
So really? it's really interesting to see um, and hear like their perspective and why they created the game and how they created the game. And I think that really resonates for our audience. In terms of our listeners, we we broadcast to the innovation community, the inventor, the the product designer, engineer, and and the innovation leader. That's who is listening right now. For the most part, we have other types of audiences too. But you're in such an interesting position where you're having to make go or no go decisions mm-hmm. at different concepts. Mm-hmm. Tell us what role storytelling plays in the pitches that you hear, mm-hmm. and maybe we can dig in a little bit to what storytelling techniques and strategies you think are most effective. So, yeah, when you're, what, what does that situation look like? You mentioned index cards, so tell sure. us about the moment of the pitch, how it comes to you, how you seek it out. Sure. So um, we solicit for games in quite a few different ways. We have a submissions link online, so sometimes people are just submitting their idea online and literally writing out, you know, kind of an elevator pitch. And um, but my favorite is when we go to conventions and they do what they call designer speed dating. <laughs> so you're literally talking to, you know, at a huge table, uh, you know, 20 to 30 different inventors, and you have about 30 seconds with each one. Um, and there's not enough time to go into the game play, right? So there's not enough time to sit there and explain every single rule or every single mechanic. Right. So the thematic and the characters of the game are really um you know, what drive the story. And so that's you know, what's interesting to me. And that's what keeps my job, <laughs> you know, alive and, wow. and fresh um, because we see hundreds of game submissions a year. So it's really how they describe, um, like I said, the thematic and then also just, you know, individual characters or um, th- that, that are inspiration for the game that really brings things to life. Wow. So 30 seconds or a yeah. tiny text box. That is an incredibly concise pitch. Yes. <laughs> so, so yeah, what do you think are the most critical touch points? You mentioned thematic. Mm-hmm. What do you mean by that? That that sounds like game design speak in my uh, to my ears. I'm not sure. Sure, what you mean. sure yeah. no problem. So, for example, I brought you a game today. It's called It's Plunderful. Thank you, by the way. <laughs> I cannot welcome. wait to play that with our team at Untold Content. It's yeah. going to be so fun. So the thematic of that game is life's awkward situations. So we all get into these. um, It could be something that someone had said to you that was awkward. It could be an experience that you ran into. Um, But that would be the thematic of that game. And so I think what appeals to me specifically, you know, when I'm looking for different themes of games is, is it relevant to our audience? Um, Even if it's you know, um, an animal kingdom or if it's about climate or things like that? Is it um, on trend with things that are going on in our environment? Is sure. it, um, you know, is it interesting to people in a, in a unique way? Game mechanics are not necessarily patentable. Um, if you if you think about, you know, rolling dice or moving sure. up three spaces or spinning a spinner or whatever it might be, I mean, those mechanics aren't really patentable. So it's really the theme mm. that sets the game apart from a lot of other things on the market. And so it has to be resonant. It has to align with trends that you see in culture or society. And so within that 30-second pitch, if it doesn't clearly, uh, if, the, if the inventor or designer doesn't have a clear pitch for how it's relevant and aligned. Do they have to be sharing data to prove that? Or is it sort of based on a shared understanding of those trends? No, I think it's more of a shared understanding, but it's also a hook, right? So something, for example, um, I don't know, I'm making it up, but maybe a circus theme. You know, I wouldn't say necessarily that the circus is potentially on trend right this second, sure. but everyone can relate to it. Yes, and yes, it's something, yeah. so if they're bringing something alive from something that exists in society um, that a lot of people have, you know, an affinity for, or maybe or it brings up some sort of nostalgia. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So interesting. So, okay. After, you know, that pitch, well, actually, let me dig a little deeper. Sure. <laughs> What's the worst pitch you've ever heard? You don't have to call out the person or the game concept, but if you could kind of share with us, you know, what makes for a terrible recipe in that moment? I think if they're not clear, if someone isn't clear on what exactly they're trying to express, a lot of times people are 
hesitant to share ideas because they think they're um, either, you know, not qualified or, um, you know, pot- potentially they're just nervous or maybe someone will think my idea is stupid, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I would say that I don't know that there's necessarily a bad pitch as long as you have confidence and you believe in, you know, the subject matter you're talking about. Yeah. Because I've seen a lot of people make a lot of uninteresting things sound really cool. <laughs> and then yeah. a lot of, you know, what I think would be something really cool sound a little boring. So, um, yeah, yeah, I think it's it's more about the, the passion with which they express it yeah. um, and how they talk about it than the actual content necessarily itself. Do you believe that everyday people can be innovative? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. That is um, one thing that I will have to give credit to the last company that I worked for. They absolutely instilled that in and me. Who they, was that? Um, it was a company called Axiom. Okay. Um, so I did a little bit of um, packaging product development. Okay. And the owners of that company were very big on, you know, providing people with opportunities to um, be a part of brainstorming sessions. And they just never looked at it as... Um, you know, you didn't have to be an expert in your field to, to you know, make a new product or have a good idea. Um, yeah. They believed it could even be, you know, a novice or someone in an adjacent field that oftentimes have the the better perspective because they're not so immersed in the day-to-day details. Um, and they can kind of look at the bigger picture. Um, so they, they provided a lot of us an opportunity to do that. So I, I fully believe in that. <laughs> you know, it, it's... To me, it's one surprise element of our conversation is Mm -hmm. I sort of assumed that there was an elite group of game designers and they're controlling the game design universe. And I'm sure those people exist who've had like repeat success and that sort of thing. But it also sounds like for for the role that you play and the philosophy that, that your company brings to this market, you really look to hear, you you open your ears to any any idea it's coming from a, a sixth grade teacher or even from a five year old. So yeah, that's a, that's kind of a unique approach, but I think it speaks to how critical diversity and inclusion are to innovation that if you really believe that your consumer can be your best innovator, that's that's a really unique. Uh, I, I see innovation teams moving in that direction, some faster than others. Sure, absolutely. And it, to your point, a lot of people do not. I did not know that before I, you know, started in this industry. But um, with games specifically, I mean, it, most of the time, it's just a side hustle that people just really enjoy doing. It's passion. Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, we deal with you know people that are doctors, people that are you know, moms and dads, like, it doesn't matter, you know, what your experience is necessarily. Um, it's just, you know, creating a passion for the game and and, and the game play. Um, so, yeah, oftentimes they don't get the, the recognition they deserve. <laughs> yeah. But, um, yeah, we see it from a lot of different people. It's and um, recently I was in um, Chicago for the Chicago Toy and Game Fair, which is a huge um, toy and game conference and also trade show. That sounds um, fun. Your, your job does not sound <laughs> boring or stiff. It's not boring. It's really fun. We get a lot of playtime. You know, not a lot of companies can say that. So <laughs> that part of it's really cool. Um, but I had the pleasure of being a judge for the Young Inventors Challenge. And these kids were, you know, anywhere between, I think, like first and fifth grade, maybe. Um, and they were so adorable and so <laughs> well spoken. And their ideas just. I mean, you know, we're asking them questions, and you can tell, you know, a few of them, maybe mom and dad had coached a little (laughs) bit. Um, But other than that, I mean, they really just had these, like, great ideas. This, you know, this uh, one couple of kids specifically that I remember, they... um, they really liked going to the library, and so they made a, a really cute game about a librarian Aww. and how, you know, you act in the library. And um, Oh, so neat. So actually, it's a behavior, like, it's actually a way to help children understand why you behave certain ways in the library. Yeah, yeah. It was super cute, and um, so that was, that was really fun. Wow. Um, but yeah. <laughs> I love that. Okay, so I want to fast forward now. That that gives us such an interesting perspective on that moment that the inventor, whether that's a 5-year-old or or a 85-year-old, mm-hmm. they're pitching to you. Now you're having to make some judgment calls and you're having to get internal buy-in around which 
concepts to prioritize. Mm -hmm. How how does that part of the pitch go when it's time for you to bring that message internal and start to become a cheerleader for certain concepts? Sure. Um, And that oftentimes is the hard part because... um, not, you know, it's funny because my team, we're all a little different and we have different player profiles. Some people are super competitive. Um, and, and this Player is, profiles. Okay, hold on. Back up. <laughs> well, this is, this again sounds like a, an expert term. So what, what does that mean in the game design world? Okay, so we look at things um, and we've kind of broken down what we call a social gamer. So people that, you know, play on average about once a week. To could be once a month. Um, they play card games. They play board games. Um, but we really wanted to break these uh, player profiles down a little bit. So we have four player profiles that we kind of um, categorize people into, if you will. Okay. Um, so we have the competitor. These are the people that play to win and that are okay. all about the strategy. Sure. Of the we game. all know that person sure. in, our, uh, <laughs> exactly. in our friend circle. <laughs> exactly. Um, and then you have the joker. Who, these are the people that are just, you know, in it to get razz people, get a laugh, that oh, kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. Um, you know, we have our feelers, which these are people that could either be playing with a purpose in terms of um, learning something new, or it could be trying to, um, what we say is more like a revealing aspect of the game is getting to know people on a deeper level. Yeah, yeah sure. Um, and then we have our connectors, which these are the people that are hosting the game nights. They're bringing everyone together, and they're not necessarily as concerned about the game itself, but just bringing their friends together and having a good time. Yeah, sure. So those are our player profiles. <laughs> and so internally, you have, so, so sort of similar to the way another workplace might take at the Enneagram or talk about, you know, um, strengths finder, strengths assessments, Mm -hmm. you kind of self-identify internally based on your approach to play. Yeah, exactly. And so you think other companies do that? Is this something I've never heard of another company that uh, that well, that. I don't know. I, you know, probably not. I'm probably giving away some of our secrets. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so we made everyone in our office take a, you know, like a, a little quiz. I love it. Um, I think that's really about valuable their, about other... their player profile. And it, it's interesting to them, too, because we can make really good recommendations for games based on what we think they'll like or what kind of combination of, of profile they are. Um, so it's really a kind of a curating system as well. Sure. Um, and, and I bet, too, by self-identifying, by knowing that, okay, I am, I tend to lean towards competitive, I am the competitor, mm-hmm. and I lean toward that kind of experience, mm-hmm. but I have to be, I have to know that, I have to own that and be aware so that when you come to me with a concept that's more aligned with the feeler, I can keep my mind open. Exactly. And that's that's the important part because I, that's what I was saying. When I... Um, you know, when we're vetting games as a team, we'll often say, well, it's not really my cup of tea, but I can see why so-and-so would like it. Gotcha. You know? Sure. Um, so we're we're trying to keep a good portfolio that's very balanced with the type of, you know, combos of player profiles and things like that. Um, we don't want to be too one-sided or too leaning towards any one, you know, specific audience. We really want to make sure there's something out there for everyone. You know, I think so often innovation teams build personas or document personas for their consumers or for their um, business partners or retailers. But internal personas is mm-hmm. something I don't see as often among innovation teams, mm-hmm. um, that, that they're acknowledging and understanding uh, the the deep, innate desires and needs, social, emotional needs, functional needs, professional goals of the people internally who they have to get buy-in from. Mm-hmm. But that could that's another really smart strategy to use as you're thinking about how to take something that you feel passionately will work and pitch it internally to get that buy-in you need to bring it to life. Exactly. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> so we spent... Um one day we were um we were when i first started i had put together kind of like a a sprint like a 5 day rapid prototyping like we're going to get in here and create a game ourselves awesome. type of thing love sprint <laughs> were you so exhausted <laughs> yes <laughs> it was really fun but since i had organized the whole thing i was i just wanted it to, you know to obviously sure. go really well yeah sure um and so i i kind of felt a lot of pressure but because we were talking about games and play you know it made it a lo- little bit easier um <laughs> But we spent a large portion of that talking about something as simple as, you know, what do people find funny and why do they find it funny? 
And we really did a deep dive for like half a day on what people find funny. You know, and it was Love just it. as as simple as that. And it was just as productive too. As, yeah. Yeah. So mm-hmm. you kind of allowed that the space to for, for that brainstorm, that ideation session to go where it needed to go. Yep. Um that's really neat. Yeah. The sprint approach is an incredible way to get condensed productivity and collaboration to happen. Mm-hmm. I love we've had we oftentimes use that methodology at untold content when we're trying to help a client come up with, you know, a certain approach or a story or product design. So mm-hmm. awesome. <laughs> so I'd love to hear, you know, what advice you have for inventors, game designers, for how they could uh, get more rapid success for their ideas. Or, mm-hmm. You know, do you have any advice for them? I think the first thing would just be... Um, don't listen to all the noise. <laughs> if you believe in something, then just have the passion for it. Own it. Um, again, I want to go back to I think that fear drives a lot of um, drives away from innovation. Um, fear of unknown, fear of what people might think of you. Um, you know, they might have presented their concept to a family friend or whatever it might be, and oh, that's stupid. Or you know, I. I hate no's. <laughs> so I feel like if you bring the passion and your purpose for why you're creating something, I think that's that's definitely really key. Um, in terms of rapid prototyping, don't worry about making it perfect. We don't care if it's perfect. We don't need it to be perfect. Um, use what you have around you. I mean, be a kid again and like go get some construction paper and some scissors <laughs> and, you know, make your little parts and pieces and, um, you know, have fun with it. I don't think, I think people are so afraid of feeling the need to present something that's whole and too perfect um, when it could be just as good in, in prototype phase. As long as you're able to get your idea across, we can imagine what the future might look like for that game or that product. I love that. Um, yeah. That's, that's amazing advice. So one last question. Mm-hmm. Is your dad so proud <laughs> that you're in innovation, that, that you, you know, you're, you're in a large uh, company, but you are also uh, serving as a kind of entrepreneur inside of that organization? Absolutely. Yeah, I think he he's totally really proud of you. <laughs> <laughs> Which I am of him as well. Um, but yeah, we still, he calls me proudly every day and he's like, hey, I got, I got a new idea for a game and what are you going to do about this? Because he, he Have works you brought at, any of your dad's games to life? Not yet, but he does work in the financial industry and there's a lot of like financial illiteracy that goes on. Yeah. So, um, I'll, you know, a lot of what we do too is we'd like to um, use games to educate people. Sure, um, That's a lot of our... Kids line, our Hoyle Kids line is about, um, you know, teaching kids emotional intelligence and things like that. Um, so yeah, so he, he calls me every oh day gosh, and so you know pings different ideas off of me, and yeah. I'll tell him like, oh, you know, there's 20 games out on the market like that already, or that one's worth exploring. <laughs> oh man, you so. know what? I, I promised you that was my last question, but I totally <laughs> lied. We forgot to talk about gamification. Yes, inside the innovation community. So. Yes. Yes, la- I-, I promise this is the last thing. I just no, want to hear your thoughts yeah. on how innovators across all industries and, and sectors can be utilizing gamification in their innovation process or to change how they think yeah. as they design. Yeah. Well, what we hear a lot is, you know, you think of gamification oftentimes as being something that you do on the computer, whether it could be, you know, applying for a job or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, But getting back to, you know, the tabletop world that I live in, um, it's so interesting to see teachers or um, work groups like Uh, A lot of work groups will be like, oh, yeah, we played a game like as an icebreaker and it helps you get to know your colleagues. It's really fun to see the the motivations that that you know, people are expressing with their games. So um, I'm a huge proponent of gamification. Anything to make um, the mundane or the ordinary a little bit more fun, why not? And it can be educational in the, in the process. So. Yeah, completely agree. <laughs> thank you. Thank you sure, so much for being you. here. This has been a, a really fun conversation, yeah. and I cannot wait to play It's Blunderful Good, with I the hope team. you have fun. <laughs> I will. Thanks. <laughs> All right. 
Thanks for listening to this week's episode. Be sure to follow us on social media and add your voice to the conversation. You can find us at Untold Content. 